All right. Um, let me see. And oops, I'm just adjusting a couple things. There we go. Um, thank you so much for being here, Nadia, and thank you for uh, your you know beautiful online exhibition. Um, this is Nadia, and is it Salik? How do you pronounce your last name? Masalik? Yeah. Okay, Nadia Masalik. Awesome, thank you. Um, Nadia won the solo exhibition from, was it from Making the Cut, I think? Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I curated um, an online group exhibition. Gosh, it's been months now. <laughs> uh, with Shoebox Projects. And yeah, Nadia got the a uh, solo exhibition, which I was thrilled. I just adore your work. I adore the message. Um, I think it's so important and it needs to be out there, especially now, <laughs> you know, definitely, especially now. So it's, I was thinking about it. It takes on this whole new, um, yeah, a whole new story, you know, with everything going on. So I'm glad, you know, that we're able to talk about it now. Um, so what I thought I would do is go ahead and share my screen. And if you kind of want to give us like an overview um, about your work and let me see, and I'll go ahead and, and everybody, um, I will put the, you can go to shoeboxprojects.com if you're um, joining us later. If, you know, this will be on our Facebook and Instagram, the video of this also, and I'll put the video in the exhibition. Um, but yeah, shoeboxprojects.com underneath exhibition. So you'll be able to go back and see Nadia's show. Um, but yeah, Nadia, if you want to go ahead and just kind of start and um, give us like a brief story overview about what your work's about, why you're doing it at this moment, and we can kind of go from there. Yeah. Um, basically, I, uh, I've been researching a lot about French Orientalism and just Orientalism in general. Orientalism is basically, it's kind of like, uh, a, like a region of study of like what would be classified as the Orient, which is now like North Africa, the Middle East um a bit of south asia and like so that i guess like form of study came out of uh it happened mostly after like napoleon's invasion of egypt but like it started even before then but basically people europeans mostly saw the orient and like especially like the ottoman empire as like this sort of foreign and really like removed space that was so different and so like wild to explore. So it like kind of came out of like a space of admiration, but of course with like the European um, kind of complex of superiority over it. So almost as if like they were studying like a different species of like human, like it didn't feel like it was very othering, very weird, the way they would describe them as like weird, beautiful, but brutish creatures. So there was a big uh, kind of wave of French Orientalism after Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. Um, a lot of artists like Jean-Léon Jérôme were going to um, like North African countries with like the troops to paint. Sometimes they wouldn't even paint much. They would just go there and study and then come back to France and then use like European models to paint these like oriental scenes. So I have been studying them a bunch and I've been thinking a lot about modern orientalism and the way that that's manifested. So like um, sexy belly dancers and Princess Jasmine and like the way that like Arab features have started to become kind of hot and like very desirable but then like without like respect for like the people actually living in those countries and the way that they operate and the cultures that they are used to and just the idea that foreign is sexy because it's like something that's like so different when it's like 
these are people and like it's not foreign if you're actually living there and you actually know those people it's only foreign if you like keep a distance away from yourself so yeah um so this painting la grande odalisque it's a really famous orientalist painting by um uh jean august dominique angres and he basically just wanted to make a painting that just showcases like the Ottoman Empire, which is now Turkey. So it's like, just like a random nude woman. I'm pretty sure the model is European, but like it's supposed to be like a Turkish um, odalisque, which is like basically like a nicer word for prostitute. So she's nude and she has a turban and she has furs all around her and like fabrics and um, a peacock fan and just like random objects that um, are just just to show off how different and like weirdly sexy and beautiful this foreign landscape is. So yeah, I wanted to repaint it and kind of objectify her worse and just like really show off the way that she is kind of, I guess like, just like lower down to an object. Like she's not painted as a person. Like she's just a figure that's like representing a foreign people. So yeah, and then I stitched on these gold coins that you might find on like a belly dancer skirt because that was my way to kind of modernize it and think about like, what are the modern oriental objects that one might showcase if you're showcasing like the modern orient in this like European like viewpoint. So yeah, that was where it all kind of started. Yeah, um, if you don't mind, I'll like jump in for a second. One of the things that, um, you know, you like the word that just keeps coming up that, you know, so many people use or so many people um, Europeans use of, you know, like Middle Eastern countries and even Africa and, you know, even Native Americans is exotic, you know, because it's not, you know, it's exactly what you've been saying. It's not European. It's not what they know. And, you know, and it's sad because it does, um, you know, it's the othering, you know, of other cultures and the marginalization and, and it's, you know, it's just an awful thing. So when you said, you know, that you're, you're making it worse in a way, I mean, you can definitely see this by even including making her blue, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like you, then she becomes an alien, you know, and I mean, look, you think of that term, you know, and like, and we call, you know, people trying to cross the border aliens. It's like, you know, so yeah, I mean, there's so such a depth to this. And um, I remember when I studied art history, you know, of course, I saw, you know, I saw these, and I thought they were beautiful and beautifully done. And, and then when you actually like read Said, you know, and, and learn about Orientalism, and it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, it's, there's, yeah, there's so much more, but there's these, you know, like Angra is still hanging in museums, you know, and you, I, what, I mean, except for us drawing attention, you know, except for artists like you actually drawing attention to what's going on, what else can be done? You know, I mean, the museums are not going to remove these. They're, you know, even though they have this sordid history, they're not going to remove them. So, I mean, it's, it's the same thing with like, look at Gauguin, you know, <laughs> who slept with 12 and 13 year olds. It's like, um, yeah, it's, so you get into all that, but, but thankfully, like I said, for artists like you, who we just need to keep the conversation going and keep talking about it and showing the work. So, which, you know, I'm honored to do. Yeah. I think it's just like important to contextualize them because I think the thing that the thing about Orientalism is I've never like disliked any of the paintings. Like all of the paintings are beautiful, especially the ones that like showcase the architecture. Like they're all gorgeous paintings. Like I used to love them more than any other paintings because it like at first I saw them and I was like, oh my gosh, these this is architecture that I recognize. These are figures that look like me. And like I saw myself in them. And then I would look at them a little more and be like, oh, this is like 
not like from my point of view, the way that I see, like if I went to Morocco and visited my cousin. So I think what like a course of action do wouldn't be necessarily to like remove the paintings, but to point out that this is like a European point of view, because um, I think they are like valuable to learn about history and they're all beautiful paintings. I think the problematic part is when people view like Europe and like the West as the norm. And then like La Grande Odalis, like the original painting is just like, oh, this is an image of the Ottoman Empire. I think it's really important to contextualize as, as this is the way that Europeans viewed the Ottoman Empire. And then it's like a valuable piece of history to learn from versus a, yeah. a really biased like way to um, educate people. Absolutely. You know, I think about that with the media today in all aspects of the media. And then you get to social media. It's like, what is true anymore? <laughs> you know, it's like without like actually going to these countries, you know, whether it is Israel or, you know, Palestine or, you know, Turkey or Iran or Africa or wherever it is, it's like until we're actually there witnessing because the media spins everything and the government spin everything. And so it's like, how do we, um, you know, know what's true firsthand accounts, of course, you know, but even then, you know, it's like it all gets political and, you know, so that's why we just, you know, need to, again, keep the conversations going and um, keep an open mind and, you know, um, and look at all viewpoints, I think is, you know, what's important. So I love how you talk about that for sure. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you want to, you know, go on and tell us more about the work? Yeah, um, well, basically, so that first piece I did, I I learned a lot from it. And then I realized that, like, maybe my course of action in, like, dealing with, like, the way I feel about Orientalism isn't to, like, take what they're doing and make it worse. Because I was, like, looking at that painting and I was like, okay, so why was I critical of the first one? Because she's nude and because she's just, like, displayed against these objects. And, like, what did I do? I did the exact same thing. Like, she's still nude. She's still, like displayed with random objects like I feel like I didn't do anything that was really productive other than like calling attention to the problem so after that I wanted to I instead of like painting more nude women I wanted to think about the language of art in the Middle East and like North Africa and if you look at like religious texts and the way that like um, more religious figures view art, um, like figuration is kind of frowned upon. Like if you think about the like the most religious figures, um, like you know Allah and the prophets, you're not supposed to like ever represent them like visually. Like it's super, super bad because it's considered disrespectful because you're taking like an entire person and all of their thoughts and all of their actions and the way that they grow and change over time and you're reducing it to a single image. So instead what they do is they kind of prefer like pattern and geometry and using that to like create art. And that's why you see so much like tile work and like beautiful designs that are based just in shape and not in any sort of figuration or realism in like every like religious building and like just most of the architecture in general. You don't really see as much like figuration and like paintings like that. So I was like, why don't I just like take some of these like problematic paintings and take the figures and then like change them in the way in their language of art so like this one what i did was i like physically like i printed out an image of a painting by jerome uh, jean leon jerome and i physically like cut into it like patterns this is like a more traditional moroccan pattern but the painting is women in algeria and then i was thinking a lot about what to replace it with. I didn't want to just like have it be empty. I didn't want to feel like I was removing something, but instead like cutting out to show something. So 
this is like a traditional it's a moroccan dress that it's not like a fancy one it's like one that you would wear while you're doing housework or something it's called a gandura but yeah so instead of using these like kind of european views of middle eastern objects i wanted to just show a middle eastern object and like replace that so that's like what a middle eastern object really is it's not like glorified or anything and it's you know it i feel like it also shows off like how vast the middle east is because like this i think is um a dress that's much more similar to more like like african like clothing versus like south asian middle eastern clothing because you know the middle east and north africa is not a monolith there's like so many like different countries that all have their own cultures and practices so showing off like my unique like moroccan experience and like these are the things that i know to be like part of my culture i love that and i also love that yeah i mean we've only gone through a couple of pieces of art already but you're changing you know and like each you know from each piece you're already learning and growing and um, and solving problems and challenging yourself. And so, you know, I love that. Cool. Let's yeah. see. Yeah, so this one was, um, I was thinking a lot about my first one again, where I was using the gold coins and I wanted to use it again. So I, I was taking a class with Andrew Norris. He's a professor at VCU. And we were doing a lot of like master copies. And so I did a master copy of this is another painting by Jean Leon Jerome um, called The Bathhouse, where it's just like, you know, a female bathhouse, which is supposed to be pretty exclusive to women. So I'm not really sure how exactly he got in. <laughs> but so in Islam, spaces are kind of treated in a very specific gendered way. Um, there's like a lot of like gendered things in Islam and one of them is that like if you go into a mosque there's going to be like a male section and like a female section and of course like they're not like exclusively like children can go into both and stuff like that but it's done in a way to kind of protect women um, of course like sometimes like if you're more extreme like it'll end up like whatever whatever but like in like the base of like what it's supposed to be is private spaces are supposed to be feminine and public spaces are masculine. So if there's like a group of women in a room, that's kind of considered a private space. But as soon as one man enters a room, it's public. If there's a group of men in a room, that's also public. So like a woman can't invade a man's space in the way that a man can invade a woman's space. That's also the reason why like some women wear hijabs, it's like considered like a way to keep a private space around you even when you're public as like a way to like protect yourself so i was thinking of like um the way that this is supposed to be like a very like safe private space it's a bathhouse where women can like feel free to be nude without like worrying about being like looked at or anything and like being uncomfortable and the fact that not just like a man but like a foreigner like a, um, which I I really like calling white men foreigners. I think it's like people don't really see them as that. I feel like they see as like oh a man venturing into a foreign land. No, you are a foreigner invading this land. Yes. So just a foreigner, a male foreigner invading their space, turning this sacred space into a public space, and now they have to worry about their safety in this space that is supposed to be where they are already safe. So, yeah. Again, I just wanted to go back to covering and like protecting and like maintaining that like private space. So I did like the master copy. I just wanted to like show that kind of difference. And I didn't want it to be as easy to like look at. So that's why I flipped it upside down, but in the main big piece, I covered it again with like these golden coins because I was like, leave the women like and their bodies alone and just like 
have your image of like this oriental space with like these gold coins you know but like take the women out of this so that was kind of my idea here yeah i love that and i like it goes back to the first piece where you know you painted her blue and at the time you weren't you may not have been doing it for this reason but now looking back you were protecting her in a way maybe without even realizing it at the time yeah 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 and i like you know i i love this piece because of the conceptual nature you know you're by turning the original upside down you're you know subverting notions you know of of male female foreigner you know i mean so many different things so um yeah i love this piece thank um, you you're welcome yeah um this one is again about like the like spaces created by women and i think as someone who like exists like in the west like i'm an american girl i've lived here my entire life when i go back to morocco i go as a visitor like i don't i've never lived there and i'm only half moroccan too so i'm very much like removed from that side of me but i wanted to kind of create like this image of like i don't know like the stress of identity as like someone who's like you know i'm i don't speak arabic i know like a couple words when i go there i speak french i speak french because that's what i could have learned in school and they were colonized by the french so we have that to communicate and just the way that like I feel kind of pulled in several directions but I think there is something about like being in like a group of like women who are like they kind of understand your experience like they know what it's like to like not be white and like even though I like my cousins I haven't seen them for like 15 years or something I will see them and it's like like we have something like there's always going to be that sort of like kind of feminine bond between us and the support that's there. So and I also wanted to play more with pattern and what it means to be like an Islamic pattern because um, I think there's like you know, like the patterns you think of, but like, of course, the Middle East is not a monolith. So like, these are patterns that are also derived from Morocco. But I do like how they're not like, instantly recognizable as like an Islamic pattern to the West. But I feel like a Moroccan would see this and they would recognize like the pattern that I made that's also inspired by the Gandura, which is the same dress that I used earlier. And like, so things that I guess trying not to work for as much of a Western audience. You know, it's interesting though. Um, and I recognize that, you know, as the Gondora and, but it's interesting, the title of hysteria, you know, which is, you know, to me, it's, it's something that any woman would understand because, you know, even like being, you know, my family's German. So, I mean, my one side of the family's German, um, you know, so I mean, I'm a white cis European female, basically. But, you know, I mean, women have been known to be, you know, considered hysterical, you know, when we're on our period, <laughs> you know, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's like, you know, where you're from or what. Um, yeah, so it's like, you know, there's a gendering there, you know, in terms of those, but it's something that any woman would understand and uh, or most women would understand and so I like how you're bringing that you know in that layer in there also yeah no I really wanted this to be like something that like you know is very unique like a uniquely feminine experience and the way that like other women will treat you when they see you in like you know if you're upset because I think there is like an inherent understanding that like your emotions are going to be kind of like not taken as seriously like pushed away and excused by like people who aren't women and like might not necessarily understand it but like i think there is more like generosity and kindness provided by other women and especially in the case of like women of color i think is like a whole another layer where like 
the idea of like um women of color are not allowed to be as upset over things and there's kind of an expectation of like you have to keep your cool otherwise like you're going to be like an example of the stereotypes of your race and like the idea of like you know angry black women and like hysterical and like spicy latino women and like that whole other like level of you need to stay composed otherwise you are a bad reflection of like your entire gender and your entire race exactly exactly Uh, all right yeah this one i did at the same time as the one on the gandura this is the um painting that the first or painting was inspired on and this was the one where I decided like, oh, I feel like I messed up on my first approach where I painted her blue. Let me try again. And I've kind of been like leaning away from actually painting recently because I've learned like, okay, like, yeah, I can paint realistically. Like, I know I can do it and I know it'll look good. Like, I know I'm not perfect, but like, I can like, you know, achieve a, you know, a realistic representation of something but in my head I'm like am I like I feel like I can say the exact same thing without like all the work and like showing off skills and I kind of wanted to focus more on like my messages that I wanted to come like come across and just like communicating like a base layer of things that's why I started printing things out so I was like if I want to make a commentary on this painting like why not just print the painting and start like messing it up and cutting it up and doing whatever I wanted with it. So that's why I have kind of been trying to work with like alternative media and not just like relying on painting just because I know I'm good at it. But yeah, so this is the kind of same idea I was talking about, but on a prayer mat instead of a gandura. Um, I've gotten um, some messages about um having like a nude body on a prayer mat and oh, gosh. a little problematic and I I understand that but yeah. I think what I was trying to do is I think the whole point is I don't want her to be nude I want to replace her nudity with something that is like a little sure to like the Islamic experience and maybe I could have been a little more tasteful and like removing more of her nudity but I did want people to recognize the original painting. I did want people to see that like, I am removing her nudity and replacing it with like the prayer mat. So yeah, no, maybe absolutely. that's something that I improve in the future, but yeah. we'll see. <laughs> well, you know, like you said, you're, you know, you're still evolving and you're still figuring things out. And like this online exhibition is a combination of painting and these more conceptual works you know, where you're using objects from your culture also. And so, um, and I know like, you know, I saw that, like you had shared one other image that's kind of, you know, your soft piece that is, you know, that we aren't showing here, but that's something you're working on, you know, for the future also. And so you're still, you know, figuring things, these things out. And I mean, I can't, that's, going to be a question for a little later is like what you're working on next (laughs) what you're planning next but um but I like how you are exploring these things and you know and it's I mean yeah people are definitely going to be you know asking these questions why you know but you know I mean and that's the thing also is you're challenging people in other cultures but also your own you know to question so and to look at things differently and um and that's also an important element of this for sure uh yeah so this one i was thinking about like you know more like representations of um of like arab and middle eastern women in media And this was a sculpture at the VMFA, which is my like local art museum. It's like huge marble sculpture. And she just has like a single boob out. It's like very tasteful. (laughs) 
but um yeah so just thinking more about representations and like if you looked at her like her face that's a european woman that's a white woman um and i think a lot of times representations of like Arab women will just be like white women with like a little more eyeliner and you know so just taking these like images and i've been playing a lot with glazing lately i really like the idea of like being able to cover something but like not completely obscure and like letting like things behind it show through so i decided to glaze just like a islamic pattern on top of it so that it didn't completely cover it but it did like change like the kind of values. So you had to like kind of fight to see both, like neither was clearer than the other. Um, so yeah, this is my version of Cleopatra. I love that, I love that. Yeah, it's, you know, yeah. So often in um, in European culture, we do see, you know, figures, you know, like Cleopatra were, you know, even the kings, you know, from Egypt and the pyramids and, you know, they are, um, you know, Europeanized. I know that's not the right word, but, you know, yeah, it's, I mean, even Jesus, you know, I mean, representations of Jesus all over the place, you know, he looks like a white man and it's like, come on, really? You know, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, no, this is great that you're drawing attention to that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, this one goes back to, um, I guess, like the way I'm trying to explore like spaces and like private feminine spaces. And I wanted to show like what it really means to be like an Islamic space and like how there isn't like a definition of like what an Arab space is. I was thinking a lot about my personal definition of my private space because like you know in the quran there's going to be like very specific definitions where it's like a private space has these people and not these people it's women and not men if it is men it's men who are related to you in this way blah blah blah, blah. so there's like a very strict like rule book where it's like what defines like a private space and what defines a public space but i think as like someone who exists in the West and like I'm not surrounded by Arabs, I think I have my own definition of like private spaces that doesn't exactly like, you know, it's like different because I am like here, I'm American, but I, yeah, so this is supposed to be like an image of my private space where maybe like it's not just about like gender, like there can be men in my private space, like um, thinking about like queerness and like having queer private spaces and safe spaces for queer people. So this kind of binary gender like doesn't play as much for me as it would in the Middle East. So defining like who would I allow into my space and still keep it private and like does race factor in it because in the Quran it doesn't say you know white people. Um, but for me, you know, maybe having a space full of people of color feels safer than like a space that's full of white people. So my approach to this piece is I just got a giant piece of plexiglass, put it up in my room. I had a light behind me and I just started like outlining my silhouette. And I was like, I'm going to physically like illustrate my private space. So I'm drawing lamps, but then I'm also like including like pattern that like I, you know, I'm attracted to and like represent like my like hometown, but also like things from like my mom's side of the family. She's from Czech Republic. Like that's a whole other side of my culture that like people don't see reflected like externally. And the way that like I have my own rules for my private space. So yeah, this is, um, yeah. I love that. Thank you for sharing this. And, you know, it's so interesting. I was thinking about it, you know, talking about public and private spaces and, um, you know, art becomes a public space because, you know, you're painting your private space, but you're putting it out there to the public. Yeah. So, you know, telling your story that way and, and what does that do? You know? Yeah. It's a really interesting thing. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But I love this on plexiglass too. Yeah. I, um, I like to hang it like a couple inches off the wall. It's right now it's at a show at, um, the VCU, um, gallery, the Anderson, um, and it's like, I made sure I was like, it has to be hung like a couple inches off the wall so you can see through it and you can see yeah. the shadows. So I wanted this and I also, it's hard to tell in the image, but I included like these adhesive mirror, like Ooh. parts, all of like the gray. Okay. If you up to it, like you would be able to see yourself. I really wanted to like play with like, you're looking into my private space and like, you better be aware of that. Like, I want you to, be like trying to interpret like the shapes but then I want you to see your face while you're doing that yeah make it like more I guess like visually clear that you are invading the space just by looking at it oh I love that you know it makes me think about um you know I don't know what you would do going further and actually well, I don't know what, you know, making an installation of your private space that people would sit in and, you know, or would you want to do that? How would you feel about that? And yeah, I mean, that could be really interesting, but I do like in this piece, you know, you can see the shadows. So this is a really great photograph of the work. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Do, is it hanging from the ceiling or... No, there's um there's a couple holes in it, and then if you put the nails in, but then no, don't put the nails all the way into the wall. You can like leave it a couple inches off, and yeah, that's enough to make the shadows. Oh, cool, cool, I love it. All right, so this one, uh, this I made in a series of two. The other one is also in here, but I was studying a lot about Jean-Léon Jérôme specifically, because I think he's just like probably one of the one of the worst French Orientalists. Like <laughs> if you look up his work, it's all bathhouses and, you know, portraits of like random Arab people, architecture, really beautiful, beautiful renditions, but also very, very European. Um, so I took, I wanted, I was thinking a lot about like gender and like the way that like both men and women are kind of fetishized by this. So this is the painting is called The Circassian Woman. Super fair skinned, like her dress is open very low, you know, um, a very, very idealized kind of like sexed up image of like um, a woman, I think, from the Circassus region. So again, I was thinking about the language of art there and how would they want to be perceived and also modesty codes, the strictest modesty codes in Islam, you're only going to see eyes and hands. So I wanted to cover her and make sure that the only parts visible were her eyes and her hands. So, and this is, um, like an actual pattern. I went to Morocco and I went to a mosque in Casablanca. And this is like from a photograph that I took this pattern. Oh, wow. I love how you're using the pattern to present, um, you know, to present her, you know, like her hand and her eye, like you were saying, you know, because of the modesty codes. Yeah, no, this is a really um, strong piece. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. This is another one um, also from the same book where I um, was doing like these repaintings of um, Jean-Léon Jérôme's um, paintings. This one is called The Slave Trade and it was just like a painting of like six women like lying down like basically for sale. And I wanted to kind of crop the image to look less like a sail and more like, you know, a woman and like the way that like a woman might, I don't know, do her thing in Morocco and not be enslaved and sold. Um, yeah, I wanted to see what I could do just by cropping an image and then layering the pattern over it and recontextualizing it. So 
yeah, more playing with glazing. Um, what I've been trying to do a lot with Jerome's work is like pay attention to the patterns he's doing because to me, that's the most valuable part of his paintings is when he's painting the architecture because he really treats it with a lot of like delicacy and care. So what I would do is I would, I took a pattern that was in another part of this painting and reincorporated it in a way that also kind of covered her. But yeah, so this is my new version of that painting that's a little less skeevy, I guess. <laughs> I love that. And I know as we get a little farther down, you, um, you know, you do more details of Jerome's patterns too. Yeah. So I really like how you're diving into that and exploring, you know, that aspect of his work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Oh yeah. And this is the, I guess like the sister painting to the Circassian woman, this painting was called the Bisharin warrior which I think was a tribe of warriors in Algeria, if I'm right, I might be wrong. But um, so like when I found these two paintings, I got a book on Jean-Léon Jerome and they were um, like two pages away from each other, but they were both like a whole page spread. And I just loved looking at them together because there was this woman, pale skin, super fair, like still like fully dressed, but like with that like tasteful cleavage you know like still a little sexy but then like the male version of this he was like very dark skinned like completely he was shirtless holding like a shield and a spear and just like kind of I don't know the way that um Europe like to like kind of push race relations onto gender to make the women these like fair skinned people who were just like so oppressed and forced to cover up and like could be saved by like Europeans. But the men were dark skinned and dark skin is evil and brutish and you know, using race to kind of, I guess, continue this dynamic. So that's why I chose these two images together but I wanted to treat them the same. I wanted them to like treat them equally because I think like even nowadays, like thinking about Palestine, I think some people like to say, oh my God, like look how evil Israel is like, cause they're like killing the women, but like no one also talks about how they're killing the men. And like, I feel like a lot of people don't treat Arab men with the same respect, like, they are also like yes there's like a lot of gender issues and like gender equality issues and a lot of more extreme um islamic nations but that does not mean that arab men shouldn't be treated with respect i think because they're arab they are like just vilified way worse so that's why i wanted to like take the two different like approaches and like fetishization but like treat them equally and cover them with the like similar patterns. So yeah, this is another pattern that I, when I went to Morocco a couple summers ago, I photographed and just copied, still kind of wanted to highlight the eyes and like the way that like, you know, instead of gazing at these people and they are now gazing at you. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, you know, for drawing attention to that. and. Um, and yeah, telling that story, I, yeah, I mean, just gender dynamics um, in, you know, while well, in every culture, but it's, no, thank you for what you're doing, <laughs> you know, drawing attention. Um, I wanted to ask you also, because, you know, you are like several of your figures, several of the paintings, you are painting the figures blue. Is there a, you know, is blue a symbol? Um, is it, you know, is there a reason you chose blue? Yeah, um, well, when I first painted, um, like the first painting, like the bright blue, I hadn't done as much research yet. That was kind of like my introduction to it. I picked the blue because I was thinking of like, what's like one of the most like unnatural colors? Like what is something that's like commodified, like objectified? And that's why I painted her blue. Like, like you were talking about like an alien, like very yeah. opposite from human. Um, and that's one thing that I was looking at a lot. 
And then I was thinking about, um, you know, again, nowadays, like things that are fetishized. And if you know anything about tourism in Morocco, you'll know that one of the most popular cities to visit is called the Blue City. It's Chef Shawen, and it's popular just because most of the buildings, floors, the ceilings, like the entire city is painted blue. Oh, wow. And I, um, yeah, if you look up the Blue City, you'll find it's like, huge tourist destination like I went there once so many white people they loved it um yeah it's like really big you'll find it on Instagram everywhere like once you see it I feel like you'll see it everywhere but yeah I took um a color class with Eleanor Thorpe and we started talking about the color blue especially um ultramarine blue and why it was so expensive um ultramarine um the pigment for the blue was mine in Afghanistan. So when I was thinking about like the way that the Ottoman Empire was kind of described as like luxurious and foreign, it's not just like luxurious, like for the people there, but it's also like, oh, look at the cool stuff we can take from there. So I think the blue to me represents like the beauty of the Middle East that is valuable to Europe, you know? Yeah. yeah. Can be taken from it and like used for Europe, which is why I've been really br- like drawn to these like blues because they're so vivid and they're so beautiful, but they're also so foreign, but like so like profitable too. And that kind of way that like many things in the Middle East, North Africa are viewed. Yeah, absolutely. And just the the idea that you're using it to both hide the figure, but also to keep it safe. You know, it's um, as kind of this, I mean, I, yeah, I, this Middle Eastern color that, um, you know, and I didn't know that ultramarine you know, came from Afghanistan. Yeah. It's like, you know, yeah. So using that, um, yeah, it becomes an even more powerful symbol. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so the next few paintings, I was thinking a lot how I've been talking a lot about like art in like the language of art in like the Middle East, North Africa and the way they want to be like, you know, I guess represented in media and in art. But like, I, I also like am very far removed. So I wanted to kind of bring my art a little closer to my experience, which is I think a very uniquely American experience. And like how I've been making art about modesty codes that I don't subscribe to. I've been making art about like things that I don't necessarily like, like I've been making art a lot about other people. So I wanted to make a couple pieces that were more about my experience is like maybe someone who is like raised Muslim but doesn't practice or someone who looks Arab but like fully American so just the way that I've kind of morphed like my Moroccanness with my Czechness with my Americanness so this one was a lot about I was thinking about body hair and how that's like a very like distinct like that's I'm Arab I'm hairy I have hair like a lot of it it's like not just like how thick my hair is but like leg hair arm hair and like how I used to be insecure of it but thinking about you know hijabs like I my hair is like a big part of my identity like my friends will tell me like oh I was looking for you I just looked for this huge ball of hair and I found you So the way that like my identity doesn't exactly like, like I rely on, like I don't, I'll go out on a Saturday night and I am not looking modest. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking a lot about how I kind of communicate like my inside with like my outside. So I was playing a lot with pattern and I really liked how the way I've painted hair kind of look like brains so like the way I'm like communicating like 
showing off my brains with my hair in the way that I was painting the past things, like showing off like their art with the pattern. So these are more like personal patterns that are coming out of me. So yeah, just like the importance of hair to me and like how I've stopped shaving and not just like my hair hair, but my body hair is important to my identity. And like, I'll wear a short skirt and like my leg hair is out and thinking about carpets and carpet fringe and how that's hairy and just like how hair is cool. I love it. <laughs> I, as you're talking and you're, you know, you are getting more personal in, you know, in these works. And I was thinking about it because, you know, I rearranged this after I sent it to you the first time to mm -hmm. kind of follow the order of the, you know, the title page that you sent me. Yeah. And but as you're talking, I'm like, oh, wait, I would have put some mm -hmm. of the works differently, curated it differently, uh -huh. you know, based on the order. And, but I still, I love yeah, how you're telling the story and it, you know, and again, how you're learning and, and it is becoming more personal, the more you go and, um, you know, yeah, yeah. So very cool though. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this one was another one about like, you know, I think one thing that I've been afraid to do is because I know my audience I'm in America, most of the people that I'm talking to are like, they're not Arab. So I've been very afraid to like critique other Arabs because I don't want people to like take what I'm saying and be like, oh my gosh, Arabs are so like evil and misogynistic and blah, 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 blah. Cause I feel like a lot of people think that already and I don't wanna give them ammo to be hateful and make like assumptions and stereotypes because I think Arab people are like some of the best people. They're so kind and generous and welcoming. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of problems with the way that like a lot of Arab men have been raised and people like, I guess, taking religious scripture and like using it to justify certain things, which is, you know. Like other countries I know. <laughs> it happens in Every religion, where yes. people take a religion and use it to justify something that is, you know, wrong. And yeah. but I think a lot of people see it that certain religions do it more, or like certain religions are worse. When like when it comes to Abrahamic religions, like they're all so similar. They're all based in the same thing. So. I think all of them have their problems and have people, religious people in like the world who use like, you know, their religions and do bad things. So I think there are a lot of like men who are raised with like ways that they look at women. So I've been thinking a lot about how kitchens kind of act as like a private space because they're inhabited by mostly women and how it's like, yes, it's like a safe space, but also, um, you know, maybe it's also a violent space because I'm thinking about like cooking and like preparing meat and like how women will be the ones like to clean a lamb and like how, what you would think of a woman like, oh, she's so delicate, she's so this, she's so that, <laughs> but she's over here like cleaning the guts of a lamb to prepare it for a man. So this one I wanted to kind of show not just like, again, like modesty codes and like what is this, like what modesty codes are acceptable in certain instances, like what is acceptable in the US versus in Morocco. Um, so, you know, the strictest modesty codes are gonna be this and the least strict are gonna be this. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wanted to play with both and this checker pa pattern is one that I've just been drawn to recently um, as a kind of, I guess, non-cultural pattern, because this is one that you will see a lot in Morocco, and it feels like a Moroccan pattern to me, but it won't be recognizable as like a specific Moroccan pattern. And the lamb I took from like the I don't know if you know the there's a holiday in Islam called Eid where basically 
you'll kill a lamb and then prepare it and that'll be like it's like a very like it's kind of like the way that like thanksgiving you always eat a turkey oh okay you, you always you sacrifice a lamb and that'll be dinner yeah and it's a very like gendered thing where like the man will kill the lamb but you'll see like a group of women cleaning it and preparing it and like i always like i won't look i'm scared i'm i'm not <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's, men, it's a very normal thing they're willing to get their hands dirty and do all that so just the way that like violence and like preparing an animal and like how that's even that is gendered and like yeah just like more personal where it comes to like where do I fit in in this yeah yeah wow a really powerful piece thank you you're welcome yeah and this one goes back to modesty codes I was thinking about how like a prayer mat and like how that kind of you expect like when you if you pray you have to like dress like as modestly as possible like you can't like if you're a woman and you're praying you have to cover your hair but then I was also thinking about like a beach mat and like what you would wear on a beach mat is probably the least clothes you're comfortable wearing when you're in public and just having that kind of how much of your body do you want visible? How much of yourself do you want to be seen? And again, playing with glazing, like covering that with like, so I glazed over the bodies with the carpet, but the bodies are still visible. Yeah, just like playing with the idea of like different carpets and different cultures. Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, I, I know it, but we I need things like this just as a reminder to, you know, I mean, how we're so similar and, you know, and, and so different, but it's, um, yeah, yeah. It's just a really powerful reminder in, you know, many different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, we get into the vessels. Yeah. So um, these I created because I've been really trying to like step away from, I guess like what you would normally consider like figuration, like representational figuration. But I wanted to do like portraits of Arab women with these. So to me, all of these are portraits. All of these like represent like a person in like through pattern. So again, thinking about these modesty codes, the only like representational things I will have on here are eyes and hands and feet, mm -hmm. which are again, up to the strictest like modesty codes, all you will see. But just like playing with like different patterns I can use. And the reason I did them on bottles is I was trying to think of what you would define as an Islamic object. So is it like, what it looks like or like does it have to be the actual object because in the quran like alcohol is like super super haram like you cannot drink alcohol but if i take the alcohol out and i take the bottle can i transform the bottle that previously was like holding something that is like inherently un-islamic does it become an error like an islamic object or like how does like the previous life affect, like affect something? How does like a contents inside affect the outside? How does the outside affect the inside? I was really inspired by a lot of architecture. Um, in Richmond, there's this theater called the Altria Theater, which used to be called the Mosque Theater. And it's this huge, like really mosque looking building like when I first came to Richmond and I saw the building, I was like, oh my God, this is such a beautiful mosque. I cannot believe there's a mosque this big in um, Richmond. And like, I've never heard about it. Like, I can't wait to go like see it. And then someone was like, Are you, you mean the theater? You mean like, <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> so, um, and I was thinking about the mosque in Virginia Beach, which is where I grew up. It's like 
a brick building it says crescent community center because they're too afraid to actually put the word mosque on it Mm. um and just like what is allowed to look islamic and what is not like wow there is something that's huge covered in islamic pattern and it's just like existing and it like everyone's like wow what a beautiful building but then like an actual mosque is too afraid to even put the word mosque on it because they're afraid of like hate crimes and attacks so just thinking like does an exterior like does that define like an object or like can like the exterior betray an interior or like can you like change an like an interior because there are actual buildings like the Hagia Sophia um, is a building that was built as a Greek temple and then it was converted into a church and then it was converted into a mosque and the architecture still is Greek and then it's just covered in calligraphy and it has now become a mosque hmm. so it's like what how much of an exterior like affects the interior like can like you could just be like a fake object like oh this is a bottle of alcohol a lot of the bottles you can see like embossing of like the words like yeah a bourbon like I cannot cover like the physical words with just a two-dimensional exterior but like is the two-dimensional like covering enough to change the context of the object and just like thinking about that yeah I love how you're using these bottles as that symbol you know, for architecture, or I mean, for bottles and architecture in many different ways. Yeah. Um, Which also goes back to the body, the woman's body, you know, and modesty and, you know, covering up and yeah, no, these are, these are brilliant. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. And then we get to the patterns. Yeah, these um, kind of go back to like the earlier pieces where I was looking at, these are all from the same book that I, when I was making um, the Circassian woman and um, the Bishran warrior. So I, when I did those, I did like an underpainting, just like fully realistic, fully master copy, just looking at the image and painting it. And I was like, oh, like I'm still painting these people. Like, if I'm really just interested in the pattern work, like, why don't I just paint the pattern? So these are, like, all of them are derived from portraiture. All of them, like, are derived from images that have a portrait in them. But I wanted to, like, try and re-represent the image just through pattern work. So it's, like, they'll be, like, sometimes I'll just, like, take something small that I'll see and just turn it into a pattern. Or sometimes I'll just like replicate the pattern exactly, but they're just like studies of patterns. So they're still portraits to me. They still communicate like the portrait that was there, but just through like an exploration of the pattern. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I love how you had it displayed in one of the pictures that in the the title list that you sent me you know how they're all um you had like 10 of them I think and they're displayed in like a um salon style format too I think that's really powerful and even seeing these six like this um yeah and where they come from yeah very cool I think that is it um let me see I'm gonna stop sharing here um no I mean thank you Nadia it you know this has been really really wonderful and you know to see all the work and hear the stories and the progression of you know where you started and then where the patterns came from and you know from public to personal and yeah I mean really really wonderful talk thank you thank you Um, And I guess like kind of to end it, what are you working on now and where are you kind of going from here? Um, You kind of nailed it when you were asking me about like installation. Yeah, no, that's (laughs) like, I was like, so like, are you stalking me or something? (laughs) Um, So what I've been working on is I've already made one tapestry, but I'm planning on making like a whole series where I kind of, instead of doing paintings, I want to create these like 
large scale, like flowy, movable, like walls. I've really been interested in the idea of a soft wall. So um, thinking about invading private spaces, if I make a wall that is fabric, you can just lift it up and walk past it. So what I'm planning on doing is making like a series of spaces with no door. So if you have, if you want to get from one space to the other, you have to physically invade the space, move the wall, lift it to get past it. Oh, I love that. Um, I want to examine like different spaces, like maybe I'll make a space that's like focusing on gender and one that's focusing on race, one that's like a queer safe space and just like different levels of spaces and just like yeah really explore like how I can section up a space and force someone to realize that they are in fact someone that is in a space that is not for them or maybe it is for them and they enter a space that they feel welcome in and then they enter a space that they're not supposed to be in and just like make it like kind of a more interactive way to incorporate the viewer so they don't feel as much because I think it's really easy to look at a painting and then look away but yeah doing this will really force anyone that looks at my art to like recognize their part and how just as like an audience member they can be invading a space and like just to be a little more like cognizant of the spaces they're taking up or maybe what spaces are private to them definitely definitely um are you familiar with is it doho su um I, sure. oh okay i think it's now i have to like look really fast i think it's um yes d-o-h-o-s-u-h um look at their work and you know they create create spaces out of like sheer fabric but it's oh, like I've definitely seen their work I yes think I just, yes I mean I am like imagining and you know I always do this I'm like oh I hope she does this <laughs> you know? I'm like I'm imagining you creating similar work without doorways you know like you said that and then yeah because it's like if you see somebody in the middle of that but there isn't a doorway it's like they had to get there somehow. And it's like you said, if you, you know, lifting it up, you know, then like you're asking the question, wait, am I supposed to be there? Is mm -hmm. it, I mean, yeah, that could be really powerful, but oh, I love where you're going. And it's so funny. A friend of mine just did an installation. I was at the opening yesterday and she had flowy fabric coming from the ceiling and they were in panels and some of them, like there were openings so you can walk through it. But yeah, I like how you're, you know, pushing that in a different, more personal direction, you know, in challenging space like that. I can't wait to see where that goes. Definitely. Yeah, already, I'll send you a, a sneak peek of the first wall that I okay, did. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> way more coming if I want to make it as awesome. big planning, so very cool well thank you again um the exhibition is going to be online so anybody that's watching this I'll put it on YouTube also um they can go and see the exhibition and anybody that's looking at the exhibition can watch the artist talk so um it's there I didn't ask does anybody have any questions um there have been a couple of people here. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has any questions or anything. Um, and if not, they, you know, can email us later on or something. So, um, but yeah, thank you. You know, I'm honored to have your work, you know, with Shoebox Projects. And thank you, Austin. <laughs> it's, I love her work too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, well, I hope you have a great night. And um, thank you again. And um, yeah, I will talk to you soon. Thank you for everything. I hope you're you welcome. Have a Great. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.